world news tonight. Deadly crash. Dozens killed and several others injured in a fatal train collision in Bangladesh. Attempted murder. An Alaskan Airlines pilot attempts to disable the aircraft engines mid-air. Cancer clues. Sydney hospital beds hope for breast cancer patients with groundbreaking results from ongoing research. Sculpture Spectacular. The world's largest free outdoor sculpture exhibition draws crowds in Australia. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We begin tonight as tragedy struck Bangladesh. At least 17 people were killed when a passenger train and a freight train collided outside Bangladesh's capital, Dhaka, during a busy holiday season. According to officials, the accident in the Kishorganj district, 45 miles east of the capital, also left over 100 others wounded. Sadiq Rahman Sabju, the chief advisor officer of Bairab, said that the passenger train was trying to switch tracks en route to Dhaka when a freight train headed in the opposite direction struck its last two coaches, which were packed with 300 passengers. Mrs. Sadikar said as the Bangladesh were celebrating Durga Puja, many were on the move from city to city. He further added that the death toll is expected to rise further. A local resident who witnessed the collision stated that it was the largest accident he has ever seen in that area. According to him, the train tracks were covered in blood and body parts. Road and ferry accidents are frequent in Bangladesh, which has struggled to upgrade its infrastructure for the demands of its population of 170 million. There have been several deadly train accidents in the recent years. Next in Indonesia, Bali declared a 14-day state of emergency due to prolonged drought. The directive will be enforced until the 1st of November and may be extended or shortened if necessary. Often dubbed the Island of the Gods, Bali is without a doubt a special and unique place known for its beaches and temples. However, an extended drought and peatland and forest fires had led to the acting governor of Bali, Sang Maid Mahendra Jaya, to declare a 14-day emergency status across the island. The directive, which was implemented on October 19th, will be enforced until November 1st and may be extended or shortened if necessary. This decision was made after Bali experienced extreme weather from July to October, resulting in 113 villages facing a water crisis and 10 areas, including the capital city of Bali, then Pasar, suffering from fires. In fact, in three regions across the island, there has been no rainfall for 94 consecutive days. This prolonged dry season is partly due to the El Nino weather phenomenon and has also led to numerous forest and land fires. By implementing this state of emergency, this would make it easier to facilitate access to mobilize human resources, equipment and other logistics to reduce the disaster's impact. However, despite the emergency statement, the head of the National Disaster Agency for Bali, Made Renton, has issued a statement to tourists informing them that the island remains a safe travel destination. He told the Bali Sun that despite the drought, forest fires and smouldering landfill fires, Bali is safe, welcoming and enjoyable destination for a vacation. Now an update on the Israel-Hamas war. Almost 20,000 people have been internally displaced in South Lebanon and elsewhere since early October as violence escalates on the Lebanese-Israeli border. And French President Emmanuel Macron landed in Israel today at a delicate juncture of its conflict with Hamas. These are fires blazing on the border between Israel and Lebanon over the weekend, the result of fighting between Israeli forces and Hezbollah. As the war between Israel and Islamist militants in Gaza continues, fears are growing that the conflict will spill over into other countries. The United Nations reported on Monday that almost 20,000 people have now been forced from their homes in Lebanon, most of them to escape the border fighting. The UN's International Organization for Migration says they started tracking the displacement on October 8th, a day after the devastating Hamas attacks on Israeli communities, Hezbollah is supporting Hamas in the war. Recently found this woman in a school converted into a temporary shelter near the border. She's saying she couldn't find another place to stay. 
Even UN peacekeepers wouldn't take them in. She was in the middle of cooking when she fled, and her neighbor's house was destroyed. Israeli communities on the border have also been evacuating, with dozens of towns and villages ordered by the government to clear out. Hezbollah hasn't fully committed its forces to the war, and it's not clear if or when it may do so. As of Monday, it's reported to have lost over two dozen fighters since October 7th, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has warned that if Hezbollah did open up a second front to the conflict, that it would bring unimaginable devastation to Lebanon. Over in the U.S., Alaskan Airlines pilot Joseph Emerson is being held in an Oregon jail and booked on 167 charges, including 83 potential counts of attempted murder. The FBI and local police allege Emerson tried to shut down the plane's engine at a cruising altitude. An off-duty pilot who attempted to disable the engines of an Alaska Airlines flight in mid-air has been charged with 83 counts of attempted murder and endangering an airplane. That's according to authorities, who say 44-year-old Joseph David Emerson was sitting in a jump seat in the cockpit of a plane bound for San Francisco Sunday when it was diverted to Portland, Oregon, after he tried to shut the engines down. The Federal Aviation Administration told airlines the man tried unsuccessfully to disable the engines by deploying the fire suppression system. It added that the crew was able to subdue him and remove him from the flight deck. Once the plane landed in Portland, the suspect was taken into custody without incident. An FAA pilot database shows Emerson is listed as a certified pilot who received a medical clearance last month. The FAA told airlines in a separate notice on Monday the incident, quote, is not connected in any way, shape or form to current world events, but said it is, quote, always good practice to maintain vigilance. Road to the White House now, where we bring you the latest U.S. election updates. Trump's political and legal worlds are colliding. Other criminal defendants might play it safe when a gag order they've been subjected to gets temporarily lifted. But then again, Donald Trump is not your average defendant. At a series of appearances in New Hampshire, the former president seemed to take delight in flouting the court system that now endangers his livelihood and the judges urging him to watch his mouth. Clearer still was that he fully intends to wiring political advantage out of the cases he is navigating. Hours before he is expected to appear back in court for his civil fraud trial in New York, Trump stood on a stage in a cavernous sport complex in southern New Hampshire and hurled insults at President Joe Biden and his Justice Department. He mocked New York Attorney General Tish James and swiped at Fulton County District Attorney Fanny Wills. And he also wondered if his indictment could make his late father proud. Trump and his allies have long used the criminal cases against him to rally the MAGA base, an enduring feature of his unique brand of grievance politics. But never have those legal problems so clearly intersected with his political fate until now. Welcome back. The U.S. United Auto Workers Union went on strike at Chrysler Parents Lance's largest assembly plant, hitting the automaker's profitable Ram 1500 pickup truck production in a major expansion of the more than month old strike. The U.S. auto strike is ramping up again. On Monday, the United Auto Workers Union called a walkout at the largest plant operated by Stellantis. That's the parent firm of Chrysler and other brands. The new stoppage hits production of the firm's big-selling Ram pickup trucks and marks a major escalation of the dispute. Speaking outside the plant, UAW chief Sean Fain said the big auto firms could make a deal if they wanted to. We know they can. I mean, they've made a quarter of a trillion dollars in the last decade. I mean, Stellantis alone made $12 billion in the first six months of this year. They can afford this. They can make it happen. Our workers deserve their share. I mean, while they say they can't afford this, the next day they announce more dividends for shareholders. 
I mean, so, you know, they're sending mixed messages. More than 40,000 workers at Ford, General Motors and Stellantis have now gone on strike since the industrial action began in mid-September. They're demanding better pay and conditions as the cost of living soars. Stellantis said it was outraged by the new walkout, which comes after it submitted a more generous offer last week. The company says it proposed a 23% hike phased in over the next few years and never received a counter-offer from the union. Now analysts estimate the strike at the Michigan truck plant will cost Stellantis around $110 million per week in lost earnings. It's similar to an earlier move by the union to target Ford's biggest plant. Both moves hit the output of pickups, which are among the industry's most profitable vehicles. Fain last week warned of more strikes if there's no deal and urged union members not to be tempted by existing pay rise offers. A Sydney hospital in Australia is making major advancements towards a cure for breast cancer. To help improve treatment for forms of cancer, the hospital has started to grow mini tumours from human cells. When 51-year-old Joe was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of breast cancer eight years ago, treatment was tough. I had 16 rounds of chemo, yes. It was very full on. Now, Cabrini Hospital and Monash University are breeding tiny breast cancer tumours called organoids in the lab to work out how to ultimately destroy them in people. It's a cool thing, organoids. So basically it's a three-dimensional tumour grown outside the body. Professor Gary Richardson says the teeny tumours are literally living clones of a patient's cancer, just on a smaller scale. The end game is to be able to take tumour from a person, grow it, test it and give them the best treatment. These are the first organoids in the world produced from metastatic breast cancer cells. Breast cancer that would be considered to be incurable. Joe and four other survivors have formed Breast Friends by the Bay, a foundation which has raised close to $100,000 for this research. I've really tried to focus on how I can give back. It's very encouraging and it's exciting too, yeah. In other related news now, South Korea and Saudi Arabia released their first joint statement in 43 years. The two also freshly voiced concerns over the Israeli-Hamas conflict. South Korea and Saudi Arabia jointly rejected actions targeting civilians in the escalating situation between Israel and Palestine, while agreeing to work with the international community for swift humanitarian assistance to suffering civilians. The statement also said the two sides stressed the importance of intensifying efforts to prevent the conflict from spreading and the need for political solution and durable peace based on the two-state solution. This as Hor and Riyadh came up with a joint statement on Tuesday, their first in 43 years, in light of President Yoon Song yeols state visit to Saudi Arabia hosted by Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The statement comprised of 44 specific items of cooperation between Saudi and Riyadh covered all areas from economic cooperation and cultural exchanges to regional security in the Middle East and East Asia. The two also agreed to actively explore the expansion of mutual investments in areas including the hydrogen economy, smart cities, future mobility means and startups. As the two countries celebrate 50 years since South Korea's first construction project in Saudi Arabia, they agree to continue building on this exchange with Saudi's ambitious Vision 2030 and Naon project and other Giga projects such as the Red Sea project. The statement also showed motivations for the two to enhance cooperation in defense and defense industry. In fact, on Monday, President Yoon also met with Khalid bin Salman Al Saud, Saudi Defense Minister and other military officials where they showed interest in jointly working with South Korea's arms production. The top office says this has paved the way for even more export deals for South Korean arms companies. Energy cooperation, conventional and new, was also mentioned in the statement. Saudi Arabia pledged to be the most reliable partner for crude oil while South Korea is set to work with Riyadh for clean hydrogen and peaceful use of nuclear energy. Both sides also welcomed the growing popularity of Korean culture in Saudi Arabia and agreed expanding opportunities for civilian exchanges between the two countries. 
US tech giant Microsoft is teaming up with the Australian government to fend off major cyber attacks with a new multi-billion dollar cyber shield. More on that now. A face among the flags. At Arlington National Cemetery, surrounded by hundreds of thousands of headstones, Anthony Albanese paying tribute to those that fell alongside Australian troops. Tonight, the focus is on wars still to come. My visit is focusing on building an alliance for the future. Microsoft tonight announcing a $5 billion partnership, including developing artificial intelligence and the establishment of Australia's first cyber shield alongside the Australian Signals Directorate. This new initiative uh, really allows us to turbocharge our capability to protect all Australians better than we ever have before. Strengthening our digital infrastructure and protecting Australians from growing cyber threats. We're getting ahead, we're getting some competitive advantage. I think in many ways AI will probably be as important to the future of the world as inventions like the printing press or electricity. And at a campus in Sydney's west, these technologies of the future are being taught today. Microsoft's investment will help deliver and develop the digital tradies that are needed now and well into the future in Australia. To really take advantage of it, we need to have the skilled workers and the pipeline of skilled workers uh, to be able to really realise this opportunity. Microsoft committing to training 300,000 Australians in the field if they can be found. It really represents the best of Australia and America working together. It's critical to see AUKUS legislation passed as quickly as possible. There isn't time to waste. But amid rising global tension, <laughs> the Prime Minister left to focus on what he can control. That's what this is about here. Win, win, win for Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom. Welcome back. Criminal groups set at least 35 buses on fire in the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro. More on that story and more, let's take it around the world for a minute. The Bolivian city of Santa Cruz issued a red sanitary alert and cancelled school after wildfires across the region caused heavy pollution. Criminal groups set at least 35 buses on fire in the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro after police killed a crime boss in an operation. Sweet Boy Bobby, the world's oldest dog, has died at the age of 31 years and 165 days. Human faces sculpted into stone after 2,000 years ago have appeared on a rocky outcropping on the Amazon River. Now Republicans are officially running for speaker after almost three weeks without a leader in the house. That is all we have for you on World News tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Adaderina English. We're leaving you tonight in Sydney, Australia, as the world's largest free outdoor sculpture exhibition showcased local artists, proving a major draw card. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.